for this morning. Uh, just a, a show of hands. How many of you in this building are ordained as elder, pastor, or deacon? Good, I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> Listen now for the reading from Philemon. It is Paul's shortest letter. I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Athea, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him back, that is my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your service during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping through your prayers to be restored to you. The word of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The book of Philemon is sort of a triangle in this congregation. There is Paul, there is Philemon, and then there is Onesimus. Philemon was a member of the congregation, a small town in western Turkey. Philemon had first heard the good news from the Apostle Paul. In fact, the Apostle is bold to say that Philemon owes his very life to him, that is, his life in Christ. Obviously, they had a close and loving relationship. Now, Philemon was also a slave owner, and one of his slaves was named Onesimus. And it appears that Onesimus stole some money and ran away from his master and ended up, surprisingly, attending to Paul in prison. And as a prisoner, Paul needed all the help he could get, like food or parchment or even some clothes to wear. Why 
Onesimus went to assist Paul is anybody's guess. Had Paul shown a special kindness to Onesimus? Did Onesimus think that Paul could help him gain his freedom? Or would Paul plead his case? We're not sure, but this we know. During the imprisonment of Paul, Onesimus had become a Christian because of what Paul said. Onesimus did indeed run away because he must have been at odds with Philemon. And surely Philemon was upset that his slave had run away. The slave owner in that time had every legal right to have a runaway slave severely punished, even executed. So Paul faces this problem, how to reconcile this master and this slave, both of whom are now Christians. Paul had to deal with both the haves and the have-nots in the Christian community. So it was then, and so it is now. So how does Paul deal with this ticklish pastoral issue? Well, first of all, he tells Philemon that he is sending Onesimus back to him. He calls him his very own heart. Now he hopes that Onesimus will be more useful to him as he had been to Paul. In fact, Paul lets on how much he loves this slave and would have really wished he could have stayed there. Yet Paul hoped that Philemon would make him as welcome as Philemon had made Paul welcome. Now, Paul does not directly challenge the institution of slavery, but he does challenge the inherent brutality in that system. So Paul asked a favor of Philemon without issuing an order from on high. Rather, Paul appeals to him on the basis of the love of Christ for a wayward brother, now who is more than a slave. Paul asked his friend to voluntarily receive Onesimus back, even implying that he might want to consider freeing Onesimus. How can Paul make such a request? Quite simply, Paul has a friendship, a deep and abiding friendship with Philemon. He calls him my partner in the gospel, his fellow worker. And Paul insists that if the slave has stole any money from him, that Paul himself will repay it. A bold promise from a guy in jail. And to top it all off, Paul says that he covets the prayers of Philemon and the whole church for his free freedom. And when by the grace of God he hopes to get out, he says, I'm going to come and stay with you, Philemon, and prepare a guest room for me. In other words, I want to check on how things are going between you and Onesimus. And hopefully, Onesimus has become useful to this master. Now, we really don't know the rest of this story. We don't know what happened. But we can surmise that maybe it turned out quite well. Otherwise, why would we have this text in our canon? A ticklish pastoral problem has perhaps been resolved because of Paul's ministry. Now, I really do marvel at the deft touch that Paul displays. He cares about both parties in this incident. Paul understands the problematic nature of the institution of slavery. It hovered above this story like all great social issues do. He cares about how Christians treat each other even how they feel about each other. He urges a marvelous reconciliation. He offers to be a bridge between these two who are so very, very different from one another. And he acknowledges that his heart and soul are involved in this matter. Onesimus had become as dear to Paul as Philemon had. These people now are his friends in Christ, and he hopes 
they will become friends. So Paul is no objective observer about this pastoral issue. Like most pastors, he is up to his neck personally in what's going on. As I think over the last 47 years in ministry, I suppose what it has meant to me the most is this, being up to my neck personally in the lives of my people, all in the context of the church. Our life in Christ means something to me, and it's also in the context of our world with its many complex and difficult social and political issues, issues of war and race and poverty and economic disparity and, and environmental degradation and, of course, sexism. In other words, all the issues of our time hover over the ministry and the life of the church. Ministry is never in a vacuum. It's always in the midst of real life social and political issues and in the church specific. I was ordained 45 years ago this Friday at First United Presbyterian Church in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I remember that day fondly, as I'm sure many of you do as well. I remember the moving moment when the hands were laid upon me and the prayers were made and the words of encouragement. Those have shaped my life for lo these many years. It has been my work and I remember that on this Labor Day weekend. I have served 12 different congregations and institutions over these 47 years. What has it all meant to me? I go back to Paul's letter to Philemon. The greatest thing I have received from this marvelous journey are the many relationships, the people, my brothers and sisters in Christ, friendships in Christ, because of Christ, through Christ, people I would have never known except for Christ who brought us together. Because of the church, I have met my wife, my best friends here and all across this country. It has been about relationships that has made my life so meaningful. I'm reminded of what C.S. Lewis says in The Four Loves, that, that lovers face each other enraptured in love. Friends are shoulder to shoulder, captivated by a common concern, a common interest, a common love. We are friends in Christ because we are captivated by a common calling in Jesus Christ, our Lord. These are relationships that have spurred me to try to give my best. My homiletics professor, Bob Shelton, once said in jest about preaching, shoot low, boys, they're riding Shetlands. Actually, I have never once believed that was true. The folks who have been generous enough to listen to me in preaching and teaching have always deserved the best from me. I've always tried to shoot high, knowing that folks need and deserve something stimulating. For several years, I, I served First Presbyterian Church in Victoria, Texas. And about halfway down on the left, you're sitting there, Gary, was a guy named John Svoboda. He was from a Czechoslovakian background. And John told me that he had been a lifetime Presbyterian and he would come to church and during the prelude, he would look at the order of service, see the text that was gonna be the sermon text and the title. And he told me 95% of the time, he could guess exactly what the preacher was gonna say. And he did not mean that as a compliment. My goal now and then is to offer something more than that, the usual pablum. Every time I speak, I think of John Svoboda. He's like a little spur within my head saying, is there something more? Can you tell us something that would be enlightening and enriching? What ordination is to me is this call 
to offer my best that I can. I don't always succeed, but I feel keenly this desire, realizing that the one we serve is greater than any of us. Finally, I'd like to say this. Ordination has meant so much to me in my own spiritual journey. I began my work in the church while in seminary doing youth ministry. And my first two years before I was ordained was in youth ministry. And the next three years were in youth ministry. Then there were 13 years of campus ministry in three different settings, as well as serving pastor in some churches. My journey of faith has been deeply impacted by all the youth and college people. It has been my joy to serve. Those folks have always insisted that I ask this question of myself and them. What does the Christian life look like in the eyes of the young? That has helped my faith enormously. Faith should be forever young forever exploring, forever widening, and figuring out better ways to serve Christ into our world. I hope to God that I never bore the people of God. And I hope to God that I will always be stimulated by this ever young gospel that calls us beyond ourselves. When I said yes to ordination, I prayed that the gospel would never be old hat. And I suppose that's why I keep teaching college folks. They challenge me time and again to ask, what does the faith look like in the eyes of the young? Well, I also consider that this gift of ordination has meant these marvelous friendships that I've mentioned all over the country. It has meant that I've been challenged, as Oswald Chambers once said, to give my utmost for his highest. I take seriously that ordination is a high calling because we serve someone greater than any of us. And I am so grateful for the privilege that ordination has given me to interact with young people, all those youth, all those college students, I always hope and pray that I will remind myself that the gospel is always and forever young. I close with these words from one of my favorite hymns, a hymn that perhaps is in the hearts of many of you. You know the words. Oh, Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side, nor wander from the pathway if thou wilt be my God. Thanks be to God who gives us more than we can ever ask or imagine. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Sisters and brothers, I invite you to stand and say with me our affirmation taken from 1 Corinthians 12, often used in ordination services. I invite us to read the whole part in unison together. There are varieties of gifts, but it is the same spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together, we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Amen.